Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading. Today we are going to analyze the Hindu dated 2nd of March 2020. Displayed on the screen is a list of articles that we are going to discuss today. Time stamping for the same has been provided in the description video. Let's begin our analysis. The first analysis in today's session is actually a combination of multiple articles that are printed in today's newspaper. Page number 13, there is an article which talks about experts raise concern for India over US Taliban agreement. Page number 10, there is an editorial which talks about a big bad deal. Page number 11, on the op-ed section, there is an article which talks about a deal that increases uncertainty. Now, as far as this topic is concerned, this topic is important from the perspective of international relation and will be important from the perspective of general studies paper 2. Now, when we talk about the peace deal between the US and Taliban, this peace deal has been discussed in detail by Baswar sir in the DNS of 1st of March 2020. However, the current discussion is basically focused on India's concern on the peace deal. You can see that all three articles basically focus on the concerns for India. Second important aspect is why this peace deal may not last in the long run. We know that both US and Taliban are in a hurry to come to terms in which US will withdraw its forces from Afghanistan. At the same time, when we see these things in the long term perspectives, many things that are committed right now in the US Taliban peace deal may not fructify in the time to come. And hence, the longevity of the peace deal is also being questioned in this article through editorial at the same time in the open section as well. Now, in the analysis, we'll be focusing on the India's concern of the peace deal. At the same time, we will also be focusing on the kind of benefits or problems various stakeholders might face in the time to come. Now, we know that there are multiple stakeholders, but we will be focusing on the US, we will be focusing on Taliban, we will be focusing on Afghanistan government and we will be focusing on India. In this scope, we will try to present the ideas in which you can understand what kind of benefits these stakeholders will get. At the same time, the kind of problems these stakeholders might bump into in future. Now, this topic is very important from the perspective of regional peace and security and the role of India in this context is very important. Now, we know that there are multiple problems in the US Taliban peace deal and it has impact on India as well. We can say that India has accepted the US Taliban peace agreement that was conducted in Doha and also the US Afghanistan peace process which took place in Kabul. However, it won't be incorrect to say that India could not assert its power of being a significant regional player in this entire scheme of things. As India has already invested hugely in Afghanistan and if Taliban comes into the power, then India's interest will be negatively impacted. In this context, when India has acted more as a spectator in this entire scheme of things, we need to understand the kind of concern India might have with this kind of peace deal. The first thing that we must highlight in this case is that terms of the deal are not much clear in this context. Now why we say so? We say so because the interest of the US is to move out of Afghanistan as early as possible as was the commitment from Mr. Donald Trump. Second important aspect is Taliban also wants the same thing. However, the current Afghanistan government would have wanted to continue US troops in Afghanistan till the time a peace deal has been negotiated. Right now, whatever is said in terms of peace deal is actually not a peace deal. It is an arrangement in which US will facilitate a peace deal between Afghan government and Taliban. So we can call this peace deal as a stepping stone towards a bigger peace deal which might bring peace and regional security in the area. However, in the current scheme of things, this is not going to happen through this deal. So first thing first, the terms of the deal are not much clear right now. Second important aspect is Taliban has committed much more than what it can do. Now, one of the primary concern for US is before any kind of peace deal is negotiated that they should maintain ceasefire. It means that Taliban won't attack US armed forces or their allies in this case. This actually failed in the previous occurrence and US then cancelled its peace deal with Taliban. Now here, Taliban has again committed the same thing and they have maintained ceasefire. But at the same time, delivering this thing in the long term of four, four and a half months would be a very difficult task for Taliban as well. Moreover, here not only the interest of the US, but also of its allies are important for this peace deal, which seems to be a far-fetched idea 
considering the kind of instability that we have seen in Afghanistan. Apart from that, Taliban has also committed that it will not allow terrorist activities from its soil that may jeopardize the strategic interest of US and its allies. Now, in the current scheme of things, the kind of terrorism that we have seen in the recent past, this again seems to be a very far-fetched idea. And moreover, to maintain this kind of a commitment in the long run is going to be much difficult for the Taliban, who is a party in this negotiation. Third important aspect that is very important here to understand that important items like constitution, rule of law, democracy and elections are not discussed so far. Now here it is important to understand that India as a country is hugely invested in Afghanistan government. The current Ashraf Ghani government has facilitated many things for India and at the same time it is important in the region to maintain democracy, rule of law and regular elections. In this context, these points are not even discussed in the US Taliban peace deal. These points will be discussed once US will start acting as a facilitator between Afghan government and Taliban for the actual peace deal. Now here in this context, it is important for us to understand the kind of governance Taliban has implemented in its previous term in Afghanistan was full of extreme measures. In this case, it is difficult to believe that constitution, rule of law, democracy and election would take place in the time to come if the Taliban government comes into power. And this is another aspect that India is worried about. Now the fourth question which is actually very important from the India's perspective is does the allies of US include India? Now as already mentioned, Taliban has committed that it will not allow its soil to be used for terrorist activities against the US and its allies. In this context, in the current scheme of things, India does not figure into the list of US allies. And moreover, when we talk about the impact on India, any kind of terrorist activities which is started from Afghanistan under the regime of Taliban or in the areas which are controlled by Taliban would have an impact on India. Now in this context, since this thing is not much clear right now, we need to have more clarity on this issue. India's interests are very important in the case of Afghanistan because India is heavily invested with the Ashraf Ghani government. At the same time, good relationships with Afghanistan are important for India in terms of developing trade, commerce and cultural exchange and also to strengthen India's role in maintaining regional peace and security. Now in this context, it is very important for India to find a perfect balance between the US, Taliban and Afghanistan government. However, in the current scheme of things, this issue is not much clear and we need more clarity on this. Fifth important concern is mainstreaming of Haqqani network which may go against India's interest. Now Haqqani network which is more of a sister concern of lashkar e taiba is responsible for bombing of Indian embassy in 2008. Another important feature of this peace agreement between US and Taliban is that around 5,000 Talibani prisoners will be released by March 10, 2020 and the remainder of them will be released in next three months. At the same time, the US has also committed that it will ensure that Taliban leaders are off the UN Security Council's sanction list. This particular action by US will have multiple impacts for India also in the context of Pakistan as well. If such a proposal is passed by UN Security Council, then it will bring down the number of terrorists that Pakistan is accused of harboring, which is one of the primary condition to the FATF grey list conditions. This might benefit Pakistan during the June 2020 FATF plenary when it faces the blacklist for not complying. Now in this context, mainstreaming of Haqqani network along with that release of Taliban leaders and striking their names off from the United Nations Security Council sanction list will have multiple impact which India should take care of right now. Now the sixth point in this discussion is handing the power to Taliban. Now we know that the current force status of US is around 14,500 and in the next four and a half months this number will come down to 8,600. Now this will expose much of the area of Afghanistan which can be taken control by Taliban. As we discuss this news today, we know that around 50% of Afghanistan is already under the control of Taliban. And once the number of forces of US has been reduced to 8,600, then more area of Afghanistan will come under the ambit of Taliban. 
Now this also implies that Ashraf Ghani government which came to power in 2019 will work for the interim period only. Now this is again very important for the fact that Ashraf Ghani government is democratically elected and which was also recognized by India. As already mentioned, Indian government is hugely invested in Ashraf Ghani government in terms of police, election, democracy, rule of law, etc. Now in this case, if Ashraf Ghani government goes and the Taliban-led government comes into power, India's interest will be hugely sacrificed. So it is very important for us to understand the kind of concerns that India has and at the same time, what kind of action or positive action India can take to make necessary adjustment in this entire process. Now, one of the adjustment that we have seen so far is that India has not accepted Taliban government. But in the current scheme of things, where US Taliban peace deal was negotiated in Doha, then India has accepted this peace deal. It means that India is accepting Taliban as a major player of force in Afghanistan. Now, based upon the understanding that we have developed from all three articles, let's focus on the comparative assessment of various stakeholders in the US-Afghanistan peace deal. Now, we know that on the left-hand side, we have highlighted the stakeholders. The stakeholders are namely four in this case because we are focusing from the India perspective. So, the stakeholder is the US, the Taliban, the current Afghanistan government led by Ashraf Ghani and India. Now, it is very important for us to understand the current situation of these stakeholders. So let's take the example of the US first. Now, it has almost been 19 years for the US in terms of Afghanistan crisis. It has been hugely embroiled after the September 11 attack. And since then, it has already invested around $2 trillion and around 3,500 soldiers of US have lost their life. So in this context, we can see that the situation has not been very conducive for US. At the same time, on the home turf, whether we talk about Barack Obama or about Donald Trump, both have promised that they want to get out of Afghanistan quagmire. In this case, there is compulsion on US to move out of Afghanistan. Now, what kind of benefits we can expect from such a movement? Benefits are very simple. First and foremost, they will be out of the problem zone, which has been causing a lot of financial and resource-wise strain. At the same time, US people are not in support of maintaining their troops in Afghanistan. So this is going to be the greatest benefit that they can draw from this. Apart from that, through this peace negotiation, security of the interest of US and its allies has been secured. So in this case, US will be benefited in this fashion. Now, as far as the problems that might bestow on this system is that Afghanistan would still be the breeding ground for the terrorism and drug trade. Now, one of the primary reasons why US entered Afghanistan was to remove the terrorism network that was established by Osama bin Laden. Now, in this context, Taliban was also hand in glove with Osama bin Laden and the terror network that they have established has been providing terrorists all over the world. In this case, we can see that this problem is far from over. Apart from that, democratically elected government of Mr. Ashraf Ghani might be compromised in this case. As discussed in our analysis as well, we have seen that Ashraf Ghani government might just act as an interim government in the time being. Over and above, there are various ethnic groups. We know that the Taliban is primarily dominated by Pashtuns. But this kind of a peace negotiation would lead to dominance of Pashtuns and other ethnic groups might be alienated in this case. So we know that Pashtuns interests would definitely be protected, but interest of other ethnic groups like Uzbek or Taziks would not survive in this peace negotiation. Second stakeholder in this entire scheme of thing is Taliban itself, which controls more than the 50% of the area in Afghanistan. Now, Taliban was earlier known as the harbinger of terrorism across the world. In this case, they have maintained their strength over a period of time. And they have actually fought against the strongest nation in the world and survived in this case. In this case, it appears that their control would increase in future. Now, the kinds of benefit that might accrue for Taliban is First, recognition of Taliban as a political entity. Now, since US has already started negotiation with Taliban, Taliban leaders will be off the UN Security Council's terror list. And in that case, it seems that this is a win-win situation for Taliban. Apart from that, one primary agenda of Taliban was the ouster of US from the Afghan soil. This is also achieved through this process. In the time to come, when elections are conducted after the peace deal, it may also form government 
on its own or may enter into government through partnership with some local players. It is believed that they will be back into the power in no time. Last but not the least, it will also lead to the ouster of Ashraf Ghani government. Now we know that Taliban has never accepted the elections that were conducted in 2019 and hence the status of Ashraf Ghani government according to them was illegal. Now as already mentioned, since Ashraf Ghani government would be acting more as a interim government, so this will definitely lead to ouster of Ashraf Ghani government if the peace deals go through. At the same time, there are some problems as well for Taliban. Now when you talk about Taliban, they are primarily dominated by Pashtuns. At the same time, the kind of territory they control, there are many semi-autonomous tribal groups and they may or may not support the action taken by Taliban. So in this case, the kind of outcome that this peace deal is looking for may not be practical because this semi-autonomous group may perform in any which fashion they like and hence they will be a continuous threat. If the peace deal goes through and the Taliban comes to power, then it is expected that they might take away the rights from women. Apart from that, they would implement fundamentally Islamic rule which is driven by Sharia. In that case, rights of many other groups and minorities would be compromised. So these are the kind of problems that we would see in the time to come. Now one of the greatest losers in this entire scheme is the Afghan government. They are democratically elected and they have also worked very hard in maintaining regional peace and security. At the same time, the kind of benefits that might accrue after the US mediated Afghan Taliban peace deal is that they have lasting peace and security in Afghanistan. However, skepticals of the view that this peace deal will not succeed in its objective because of its problems in terms of conflict of ideology of various players and hence this is expected but at the same time it is a far-fetched conclusion. Now, when you talk about the Afghan government, interests of various ethnic groups like Uzbeks and Taziks are also into picture. We are aware of the fact that Abdullah Abdullah, who is a Tazik leader, has already said that they do not accept Afghan government of today, that is the Ashraf Ghani government, and they may form parallel government. So if this peace deal goes through and Afghan government gets into some negotiation with Taliban, interests of various ethnic groups would be compromised and they might lead to parallel government, which could lead to another civil war in the region. Moreover, the government may fall in future as well. So Ashraf Ghani government is on a broken wing and a prayer in the current case. Last but not the least, India. India is a partner with the current Afghan government under Ashraf Ghani and we have multiple strategic interests in maintaining peace and security in Afghanistan. For this particular purpose, India has already invested a lot in terms of developing port, road network, maintaining police system and also of road and other aspect. At the same time, when we talk about the benefits, the benefits that might accrue is that India will establish itself as a credible regional player who will participate in the regional peace and security. Moreover, it has already been highlighted that India never accepted Taliban to be a significant player in Afghanistan politics. Now, in the current context, when India has accepted peace deal between the US and the Taliban, it means India is willing to mend its relationship with Taliban and this may lead to a lasting peace in the area. However, the problems of terrorism, drugs and regional stability still lurk as peace process between Afghan and Taliban is plagued by various problems. Moreover, there is a Pakistan link as well as already US has committed that many Taliban leaders would be off the UN Security Council's list and hence Pakistan may benefit in terms of FATF norms. This would be against the interest of India and hence this is another problem that India has to combat in the time to come. Moreover, as already mentioned in our analysis, the Haqqani network will be legalized and this may lead to spur in the terrorist activities in India's Jammu and Kashmir region. So in this way, we can see that US Taliban peace deal could be a landmark in maintaining the regional peace and security in Afghanistan and neighboring areas. In this context, this is very important for India and hence we should keep a close eye on this topic as it unfolds further. Page number 10 of today's newspaper presents an article which talks about wither tribunal independence. Now this article is very important from the perspective of polity and governance and in 2018 we have seen a question of tribunals in the mains examination. Now, before getting into the details of the article, which is written in a very technical fashion, 
let's first try to understand the problem of tribunals. Now, when we talk about tribunals, they are quasi-judicial bodies. At the same time, these tribunals are basically decided by selection committee. Now, when we talk about selection committee, selection committee has members from executive, which are bureaucrats, and they are also members from judiciary. At the same time, when we talk about the current status of tribunal, what happens that members of executive dominate in terms of numbers. Now, as already mentioned, tribunals are primarily quasi-judicial body and hence, if executives dominate, then the basic purpose of tribunals is defeated. So, once the selection committee comprises of people who basically dominate executive, then in that case, the tribunal which are basically made are also dominated by executive. Another aspect of making executive dominated tribunals is that state is a party in most of the tribunal cases. And in that case, if the state is party and it is dominated by executive, then in that case, neutrality of these tribunals is basically questioned. So actually, the need is to find a balance in which tribunals have members from judiciary as well as executive. And if these members are in balance, then these problems will go away. And that is what the point is that the author wants to highlight in this case. But before getting into the case per se, let's understand the context. Now, Roger Matthews versus South Indian Bank is a landmark judgment in which Supreme Court has asked the central government to make new rules for tribunals. In this case, the government of India has framed new rules 2020. Now, the article argues that new rules framed by 2020 by Ministry of Finance also violate several Supreme Court decisions. So we'll be focusing on what kind of problems these rules have. Now let's pay attention to the problems. The first concern of the Supreme Court in directing the government to make new set of rules was to ensure equality in terms of judiciary and executive. However, the 2020 rules as framed by Ministry of Finance do not offer any kind of solution in terms of equality for both. Madras Bar Association series case of 2010 had earlier ordered that there should be two judges of Supreme Court to be part of four-member selection committee. It means that when four members are being selected, two must be from judiciary and two must be from executive. That would have ensured a balanced or equal representation of both the parties. However, if we talk in the current terms, in terms of 2020 rules, these are still dominated by executive. So the first point is that there is denial of equality as was dictated by Supreme Court. Since there is denial of equality, it means the previous problem of executive dominance is being continued. Again, the selection committee as well as tribunals are still dominated by the executive members. And when this takes place, it means that the neutrality of these tribunals is under question. And that is what the court wanted to solve in the initial case. And hence, second point also goes against the indication from the court. Third important aspect is that non-judicial members can become president, chairman or chairperson of tribunal. This makes Supreme Court judge a minority in the selection committee as these tribunals are primarily dominated by the executive branch of the government. Now we have already mentioned that tribunals are quasi-judicial in nature and hence people with judicial experience should have been given preference over others. In this case, this point also goes against the indication from the Supreme Court. And this is the third problem that the author has highlighted. Fourth factor is the term of office is for four years as per the 2020 rules. And this violates the Supreme Court judgment in this case. Now, based on the Roger Matthew case, the court held that the term of three years is too short. And by the time members achieve a refined knowledge, expertise and efficiency, one term is over. So the article argues that the term of office must be from five to seven years. However, in the current system of rules of 2020, this term is fixed for four years, which Supreme Court might not accept in the time to come. Another important aspect is once more and more tribunals are being made, they basically divest the kind of power Supreme Court and other courts are having. It means that there is a need to rationalize setting up of tribunals as well. In the current scheme of things, it appears that tribunals are snatching away more and more power from the courts. And this is again a point which goes against the basic idea of tribunals. 
Another factor which is very important from the perspective of new rules is it virtually eliminates the advocates who can be appointed as judicial members. Now one of the condition that has been set for advocates to be member of tribunals is that they should have 25 years of experience. This is considered way ahead than what is required for being a judge in high court or supreme court. And this is where this is not going to stand the test of time in the time to come. Thus the article says by eliminating chances of bright advocates applying for the post of judicial members, the government surely intends to fill them with candidates from the Indian legal service or from the executive part. Because of these problems which are highlighted by the author, it seems that 2020 rules are in contradiction to many Supreme Court decisions and judgment and hence they will not last the test of time. Now as far as this article is considered, this article is written in a very legal fashion. In the PDF of this video, we have mentioned all things from the perspective of constitution as well as legal aspect. You are expected to go through the PDF to strengthen your command on this subject. Page number 9 of today's newspaper highlights a very important point water crisis looms large in Himalayan region finds a study. Now as far as the study is concerned, this was published in general water policy and it highlights the problem that are being faced by cities and towns of Hindu Kush range. Now as far as Hindu Kush range is concerned, it is considered one of the highest mountain range and it is full of glaciers. At the same time when these regions or area are facing water scarcity, it is a point of concern for everyone. So the news clearly mentions that eight towns in the Himalayan region of Bangladesh, Nepal, India and Pakistan were nearly 20 to 70 percent deficient in their water supply. And this is an alarming situation for which we should take immediate action. At the same time, this topic is important more from the perspective of environment and ecology. Also important here is to highlight that this topic is important more from the perspective of the prelims examination. Now let us first try to understand the major reasons for this water deficiency. Now first and foremost we have seen that there is unplanned urbanization especially in the urban areas of Himalayan region. Now currently around 8 to 10 percent population lives in the urban areas. However, there is a huge migration from rural to urban areas and with this it is expected that by 2050, 50 percent of the population would be living in the urban areas. Now there is pressure on urban resources, there is a lot of construction which is going on which has eaten up water bodies like lakes and ponds etc. And this has led to unplanned urbanization which has led to water deficiency. Second important aspect is Himalaya is also considered to be a very important source of tourism as well. As tourism is going annually at a rate of 6.8%, it has created huge challenge as well. As tourism has grown, there has been infrastructure created and encroachment done in the catchment area of forests and rivers. This again has compromised the water bodies in the vicinity and this has led to water scarcity in those regions which are known for tourism. You might recall that recently Shimla, which is a major tourist destination of Himachal Pradesh, actually ran out of water and they started requesting people not to come to Shimla for the purpose of tourism. So this kind of situation will become more frequent if this water problem or scarcity is not solved and this is going to negatively impact tourism as well which will have more consequences in terms of economy of that particular area. Next important aspect is the climate change itself as the climate is changing so is the weather cycle and in this context many places in Himalayan region have not received adequate rainfall and snowfall. In this context the water bodies are not recharged properly and hence and hence as water tables are falling at a faster rate this becomes a much more difficult problem to handle in the time to come. Now we are aware of the fact that Himalayan rivers are drying up and hence the dependence of people is increasing on springs as well as underground water. At the same time nearly 50 percent of the springs in the Indian Himalayan region are also drying up. This is reflected in the Niti Ayog report which was titled as Inventory and Revival of Springs in the Himalayas for Water Security. So there are two primary reasons for the dependence on the springs at the same time the drying of springs. First and foremost is the encroachment and degradation of natural water bodies which we have already mentioned as springs, ponds, lakes, canals and rivers. Over and above there is a growing disappearance of traditional water systems like stone spouts, wells and local water tanks. So as the pressure of population and tourism increases, 
on urban centers, this problem has become much more difficult to handle. Now it brings us to the question about what we can do or what is the way ahead. First and foremost, we have understood that there is an unsustainable extraction of groundwater. At the same time, springs are also drying up. Moreover, there is encroachment and hence communities were coping through short-term strategies such as groundwater extraction, which is proving to be unsustainable in nature. Now, to solve this problem, we require a holistic water management approach that includes spring shed management and plant adaptation is therefore paramount importance. Now, in this context, Niti Aayog has already proposed National Spring Water Management Program for the Himalayan region. Now, in this context, Niti Aayog has clearly outlined the importance of national spring water at the same time, how urbanization can be dealt in a manner in which springs do not dry up as fast as they are doing right now. As already mentioned, the springs are drying up at a very fast rate and it is said that around 50% of the springs have dried out in Himalayan regions. Moreover, statewide programs for rejuvenation of Himalayan springs and protection of high altitude lakes can be taken under national mission for sustaining the Himalayan ecosystem under India's national action plan on climate change. In this context, it is important for you to understand what is national mission for sustaining Himalayan ecosystem. Now, the primary objective of the mission is to develop in a time-bound manner a sustainable national capacity to continuously assess the health status of Himalayan ecosystem. Second is to enable policy bodies in their policy formulation function and also to assist states in Indian Himalayan region with implementation of actions selected for sustainable development. Now, since we are talking about Himalayan region, the states which are covered under this include Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir and Union Territory of Ladakh, Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand, Sikkim, Arunachal Pradesh, Nagaland, Manipur, Mizoram, Tripura, Meghalaya, Assam and West Bengal. So these are the states which are covered under National Mission for Sustaining the Himalayan Ecosystem. And this particular point is very important from the perspective of prelims examination. Next important aspect is to identify the carrying capacity concept of all major tourist destinations. Now when we talk about the carrying capacity, it means the number of people it can handle and that too in a sustainable manner. Now when we talk about tourist destinations, especially in Himalayan region, there is a lot of construction going on. And hence it is very important to identify the carrying capacity not only in terms of people but also in terms of infrastructure. There is another initiative by Niti Aayog which talks about launching Himalaya Calling, an awareness to action campaign as people's movement. As more and more people are informed about this particular aspect, there are chances that this will act as a positive reinforcement for people to utilize resources in a sustainable fashion. Apart from that, there is a great need to link it. With this, there is also a need to link it to more institution with Hindu Kush Himalayan Monitoring and Assessment Program. Now, from the perspective of the prelims examination, it is very important for you to know about the traditional water management systems as practiced in various parts of Himalaya. Now, when we talk about Trans-Himalayan region, these are called as Zing. In Western Himalayas, they are known as Kul, Naula, Kul and Khatri. And in Eastern Himalayas, these are known as Apatani. Page number 9 of today's newspaper presents a wonderful article which talks about India is host to 457 migratory fauna which shows the latest CMS list. Now, when we talk about CMS list, it means conservation of migratory species. Now, in the context of the examination, this topic will fall under environment and ecology and also in biodiversity. In the context of examination, it is more important from the perspective of prelims examination. So, for all those who are preparing for the coming prelims examination should pay attention to this topic. Let's first understand the context of this topic. Now, when we talk about CMS COP 13 was recently held in Gandhinagar. India was the host to the 13th COP to the Convention on Migratory Species this year. It is also important for you to know that the theme of this year's convention was Migratory Species Connect the Planet and Together We Welcome Them Home. Now let's try to understand more about CMS that is Convention on Migratory Species. First and foremost, it is a UN Global Wildlife Agreement for the conservation of migratory species, their habitats and migration routes. It was signed way back in 1979 under Bonn Convention and hence this is also called as 
Bonn Convention. There are few hidden aspects of this Bonn Convention. First, it is not legally binding and India has also been its party since 1983. As it is evident from its name itself, the aim of this activity is to seek coordinated action amongst the states of origin and states of migratory path for protecting migratory species, conserving or restoring their habitats, mitigating obstacles to migration and controlling other factors that might endanger them. Now, for the purpose of protecting these migratory species, they are normally provided into two appendix, appendix one and appendix two. Now, appendix one encompasses threatened migratory species that need strictest protection. Appendix two, on the other hand, has migratory species requiring international cooperation, species that can have unfavorable conservation status and needs enhanced international cooperation and conservation actions. Now, in this context, let's go through the key highlights of CMS Scope 13. Now, the significant highlight of the CMS Scope 13 is the inclusion of 10 new species in the CMS appendices. Now, the seven of these species were added in the appendix one, which include Asian elephant, jaguar, great Indian bustard, Bengal florican, little bustard, Antipodian albatross and ocean white tip shark. As far as appendix two is concerned, three animal species are included in this, which includes Uriyal, a wild sheep from Central Asia, smooth hammerhead shark and the taupe shark. These animal species are important from the prospective examination and hence you should keep a note of this. Apart from this, it is also important for us to know about Gandhi Nagar Declaration. Now, Gandhi Nagar Declaration calls for migratory species and the concept of ecological connectivity to be integrated and prioritized in the new post-2020 biodiversity framework. This new biodiversity framework will be adopted in the COP15 to CBD and that will held in October this year in Kunming, China. In this context, it is important to highlight that the steps are integrate biodiversity and migratory species consideration into national energy and climate policy. Now, this will ensure that countries which act as host or the countries which fall on the bird flyway will adopt those policies which will make conservation of migratory species much more easy and effective. Second important aspect is to promote wildlife friendly renewable energy. Third important aspect is to strengthen initiative to combat illegal killing and trade of migratory birds. Now in this context, not only within the country, but across the country steps and initiatives are required to combat this. Next is to mitigate the impact of linear infrastructure such as roads and railways on migratory species. As more and more countries are moving towards development, they are installing infrastructure like roads and railways which basically threaten the region where these migratory species nest and produce kids and in this context it is important to mitigate the impact of these kind of linear infrastructure. The last important point is to address unsustainable use of aquatic wild meat. As clearly mentioned in the list of species included there are many marine varieties like ocean white tip shark, the smooth hammerhead shark and tope shark. Now when we talk about these animal species the meat of this animal species is used for human consumption and this has acquired unsustainable proportions. In this case, it is important for us to understand that we need to address the unsustainable use of aquatic wild meat. Now let us focus our attention on the measures taken by India. Now as far as India is concerned, National Action Plan to save migratory birds flying into Central Asia flyway was launched in 2018. Now it is important here to highlight that there are eight major flyways. Out of these eight major flyways for the birds, three lie in India and hence an action taken on this aspect is very important from the perspective of conservation of these migratory species. Apart from that, India has also gone for establishment of an institutional facility for undertaking research and assessment of conservation of migratory species. Moreover, turtles also show the tendency to migrate and hence in this context, India has also taken measures for the conservation of marine turtles. Now, there are some important facts which are important from the perspective of prelims examination. First, the total number of migratory fauna from India is around 457 species out of 650 globally. Out of this 450 species, the highest proportion is of birds, which is around 380. 
and this is followed by mammals which includes bats and dolphins and some varieties of fish. In terms of importance, the migratory species which are important from the perspective of India is Amur falcons, bar-headed geese, black-necked cranes, marine turtles, dugongs, humpbacked whales, Siberian cranes, marine turtles and raptors. Moreover, as already mentioned, seven new species are included in the appendix one. At the same time, when we talk about India, six new species that are added in the list include Asian elephants, Great Indian Bustard, Bengal Florican, Oceanic White Tip Shark, Ural and Smooth Hammerhead Shark. So there's a difference of one such species which is extra in Appendix 1 of CMS. Page number 9 of today's newspaper presents an article which talks about Center to Review List of Monuments under Archaeological Survey of India. Now Archaeological Survey of India is an important institution from the perspective of Indian art and culture and hence we have devised a question on the same topic. The question reads, consider the following statements regarding Archaeological Survey of India. First is, it is a government agency under the Ministry of Home Affairs for researches and protection of the cultural heritage of the nation. Now the first part is correct but Ministry of Home Affairs is incorrect. Archaeological Survey of India comes under the Ministry of Culture. So statement one is incorrect. Second important aspect is for the maintenance of ancient monuments and archaeological sites and remains of national importance, the entire country is divided into 24 circles. Now here it is important to understand that this is correct. Moreover, statement 2 is part of every single option and hence statement 2 is correct. Third is one of the significant achievements of Archaeological Survey of India is deciphering of Ashokan rock edicts. Now deciphering of Ashokan rock edicts is attributed to James Princip who achieved this feat when he was part of Asiatic society. Till that time, Archaeological Survey of India was not even in operation and hence statement 3 is also incorrect. By this logic, the correct answer choice is option C that is 2 only. Page number 9 of today's newspaper presents an article which talks about Center to Review List of Monuments under Archaeological Survey of India. Now Archaeological Survey of India is an important institution from the perspective of Indian art and culture and hence we have devised a question on the same topic. The question reads, consider the following statements regarding Archaeological Survey of India. First is, it is a government agency under the Ministry of Home Affairs for researches and protection of the cultural heritage of the nation. Now the first part is correct but Ministry of Home Affairs is incorrect. Archaeological Survey of India comes under the Ministry of Culture. So statement 1 is incorrect. Second important aspect is, for the maintenance of ancient monuments and archaeological sites, and remains of national importance, the entire country is divided into 24 circles. Now here it is important to understand that this is correct. Moreover, statement 2 is part of every single option and hence statement 2 is correct. Third is, one of the significant achievements of Archaeological Survey of India is deciphering of Ashokan rock edicts. Now deciphering of Ashokan rock edicts is attributed to James Princip who achieved this feat when he was part of Asiatic society. Till that time, Archaeological Survey of India was not even in operation and hence statement 3 is also incorrect. By this logic, the correct answer choice is option C that is 2 only. On page number 6, there is a reference of Eurasian otter that is found in Chilika Lake. In this context, we have prepared a question for you so that you can highlight the important aspect from the perspective of the prelims examination. The question reads, with reference to Eurasian otter, which of the following statements is are correct? First is, Eurasian otter is an indicator species. By indicator species, we mean that it indicates the level of pollution in a particular area. This statement is correct and hence statement 1 is right. Second important aspect is, it is found along the eastern coast of India. This is incorrect as it is found along the western coast and northeast coast of India. And hence second statement is incorrect and hence correct answer choice is option A that is one only. With this we have come to the end of today's session. Let's move to the question of the day. The question for the day reads, consider the following pairs. First is traditional system of water management and second is the region and we have to match them. First box says Korambu, 
and eastern Himalayas as mentioned in front of it. Second is Kul, Kul and Khatri and western Himalayas is mentioned in front of it. Third is Zinc and Trans Himalayan region is mentioned in front of it. We have to find the correct pairs. Option A reads 1 and 3 only. Option B reads 1 and 2 only. Option C reads 2 and 3 only. And option D reads 1, 2 and 3.